Hey, folks, how's it going tonight? Hopefully, everybody is doing well. Uh, my co host and I am Mo Fitzgerald from Mo's Game Table. I'm Gary Mengel from Ard Wolf's Lair, and we are here to talk about the state of hobby wargaming. And as usual, we have exhaustively prepared for this epic event. <laughs> Which means so, we're flying by the seat of our pants, as usual. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I was even unclear as to whether we were having other folks on or not. So, but if it's just us two, that's fine. We can, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's established that we can, in fact, BS for three or four hours at a time. Yes, we so, can. So that is, that is okay. So. Well, first thing we want to say is we're going to be talking about the state of hobby wargaming tonight. And we're going to be talking about it from the hobbyist perspective, not the practitioner's perspective, such as what you guys do. Um, but what we're going to do is a little bit different than what you do with other presentations where generally everybody holds comments till the end. Uh, we want this to be much more interactive. So throw your comments up there, you know, regularly, anytime you have a question, anything we say, you want to interject something, please, please feel free to do so. And we will have uh, answers for you. If uh, we can't, we'll go find them. And uh, we will have somebody who's backstage that's going to be helping us with the producer. We'll, we'll be helping us get those questions up there. But we'll our also research team see. will get right on it. Yes, our research team will get right on it. And it'll be all for free, too. They won't even charge the usual dollar fifty. So. <laughs> so anyway, I, I kind of thought I would I would start this off by talking kind of about just in general, the uh, placing the state of hobby wargaming today and kind of the context of where we're at. And I kind of thought this through uh, literally today. Um, it seems to me like there's there's you know, this is very reductive. And to some extent, maybe it's useful and, and maybe to some extent it isn't. But but I feel like there are three sort of waves of hobby wargaming that we have seen, the first of which is dominated by Avalon Hill and SPI and runs more or less through the end of the SPI era. Um, and then by that time, Avalon Hill is a pretty different company. Um, and we start to see sort of a second wave of wargaming publishers and communities that materialize out of that. Um, and then at some point, uh, we see, a, and, and those companies, by the way, include things like, you know, companies like GMT. Um, and and multi man publishing for that matter. Uh, this kind of runs through sometime after the end of Avalon Hill as a standalone entity, um, and then the sort of the third phase consists of the newer publishers that have arisen since then, places like Compass Games and Lock and Load Publishing and Worthington Publishing and uh, all the various cluster of companies that operate uh, through Blue Panther, including the Historic Game Company and uh, White Dog Games and Holland Spiel uh, and a variety of other companies, most of which are at this point fairly small. Um, but, you know, at one point, I mean, GMT is still not that big, right? They just seem mm -hmm. like a monolith to us in our tiny little silo of, of hobby wargaming. Um, <clears throat> so that, that to me was kind of uh, interesting in the sense of framing where we are in that third wave, right? The, the beginning of which I think corresponds not necessarily to something inside Wargaming, but to the larger board gaming boom uh, and indeed analog game boom that we're seeing now and have been seeing for the last several years. Uh, a, a you know portion of which, maybe a small, tiny, microscopic portion has bled off into hobby Wargaming as well. I feel like, I said this on social media the other day, I feel like hobby wargaming is healthier now than it has been at any time since the acquisition of Avalon Hill by Hasbro and maybe since the acquisition of SPI by TSR in 1982. I feel like we're mm -hmm. in a pretty good place right now. Well, you and I have talked about this before mm -hmm. and uh, there was, I actually had this in an article on War Diary magazine as well. Uh, Lou and I had done a point counterpoint on this. And one of the things I had mentioned was, uh, just what you said, like hobby wargaming back then, that was the golden age. I think we're in a golden age right now, which is great. Uh, there was the golden age, there was the kind of the dark age, and then it it just came right back. And now we're in another golden age. And the difference from back then when the Avalon Hill days and SPI and all those big monsters, it was they had a uh, higher print, uh, print run numbers. You know, they'd run one game and they'd have maybe 50,000 copies or whatever made. Now they're running 1,500, 3,000, 5,000 print runs 
uh, maybe a little bit more for some games, but there, there are lower print runs, but we're seeing a wider variety of topics, which I think is fantastic because you can do that with a smaller print run. You don't have to take the, the higher risk that you do it. If, you know, if you're going to do 25 or 50,000, like you see in the hobby games, you know, when you're going to print a copy like ticket to ride, they're going to go out there and run 50 or hundred thousand copies because they know it's going to sell. It's evergreen. War games is a, a bit of a different, um, it's a niche within a niche. And so it's very going to, it's going to be a very small minority of people are going to play this game. And you, when you make any game on any topic, you have to, the publisher has the problem of gauging. Am I going to run 1,000, 1,500, 3,000, 5,000, 7,500, you know, whatever for that game. 250. 250. On some, you know, we have like thin red line games. It, mm -hmm. It's like boutique printing. They print like three, 400 copies of a game. Uh, almost. It's almost like boutique printing at that point. But they're also a very small operation. But because they're small operations and with all the print on demand stuff nowadays, and now book, book war games and things like that, all due to print on demand, we're seeing more get put out there by people that are, hey, I have a design idea. I, I, I'm just going to do this. I want to put it up on Amazon as a print on demand book. And you can, you can download the files to print out the maps, the counters and make them yourself and play the game. And I think that's really opened up a lot of doors for a lot of people. It's given a lot of people an outlet. It's also allowed us to see a much wider variety of games, which is why right now agreeing with your point hundred percent, this is uh, we're in a great state right now for war gaming. So it, it, to some extent, this this feeds into like larger trends with technology, right? With social media and and the internet in general, giving us a greater degree of connectivity than we had in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So in 1971, you know, this obscure guy, Gygax, in you know, from his basement in in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, to find additional players, he'd have to write a, a, a send off a postcard to Avalon Hill so they could put a classified ad in the general, mm -hmm. right? You can actually go look those up too. That's fun. Um, but, you know, now I can hop over to, you know, any of a half a dozen places where I just happen to know and visit relatively regularly where war gamers, for example, or, you know, whatever you do, if the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the local knitting circle has been replaced as well. But, um, you know, I know where the war gamers can be found. The chances are pretty good I can find somebody, even without necessarily uh, needing to recruit someone from outside war gaming whether that person mm -hmm. is inside hobby gaming or not. We've also seen, I think, uh, a greater degree of uh, diversity of mechanical approaches now than we used to see. It's not like we never saw experimental designs out of uh, SPI, especially, uh, was uh, did, a, did a lot of experimentation with design ideas. Avalon Hill did less, but not zero. There's some fairly, uh, uh, one might even say well ahead of their time, um, designs out of Avalon Hill. Uh, and I'm not talking about the stuff that came out in the 50s either. I'm talking about the stuff that Dunnigan did for Avalon mm -hmm. Hill back in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, things like 1914, which is very innovative, actually, and uh, the Origins of World War II, right? I mean, boy, that's a topic that you could easily do a game a lot like that now, and it would feel very at home. It might be, you know, different mechanically right but that mm -hmm. that's a game that's probably 30 years ahead of its time in that sense uh, other games that spi uh did specifically spi there were other innovators as well of course but but a lot of a lot of that creativity came out of spi and a lot of that in some sense was probably related to the fact that they had to put out a magazine on a periodical schedule right so mm -hmm. they, they had to have, hey, no, we got to have it by the 13th because it's got to make the go, go to the presses. Not everybody was as lucky as Avalon Hill when they they sent the they sent the stuff to the printer. They just walked it downstairs. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I had known, but I had forgotten that Quinto was like that, too, also owned by their printer. Yeah. So. And you know, Jeff brought up a, a good question or a good point there on the last one that says in the early days of avalon hill and sbi both companies could keep copies in stock from year to year without being taxed for it so you saw more copies of indiv individual titles over the years and then right below that his next comment is also uh important D, D and then magic clogged up distribution system and squeezed out war games renaissance really starts with online ordering in the 1990s now D, &D and magic did clog up the distro mm -hmm. system but at the same time uh, it wasn't just war games that got squeezed out, although war games were actually the larger share of, of the hobby gaming space was war games. And then that kind of kind of got pushed out. And in the mid 2000s is when 
the new renaissance with board gaming happened. And that's when you started to see more euros and that really popped out. And then you saw a lot more hobby games get into the market. And then the renaissance of board gaming itself really started in the late 2000s, maybe 2010. And it just took off and it just blew up. And at the same time, war gaming was continuing to grow. But a lot of that was due to the online ordering. And that was the difference between your standard go to Toys R Us or whoever and go pick up a game. Or now it's Target where you go to get a lot of mm-hmm. games or Walmart uh, into your standard distribution channel. And with war games, uh, GMT is pretty much the only one that is in the distribution channel. Really, I mean, there's there's some others that are out there, but not to the same extent that GMT Mm -hmm. is in comparison for war gamers. So war gamers will go directly to the publisher themselves to buy their games, which is uh, actually I think is better uh, and more preferred for the publisher because they don't Mm -hmm. have to give out or sell it at a lower price to the distribution center Mm -hmm. or distribution channel, I should say. This way they can keep more of the profits and that makes them more healthy. And uh, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I don't actually know the details of this because I'm not a tax attorney. Um, but uh, <laughs> there there was apparently a tax law change sometime around 1980, give or take three years, um, that uh, created an environment where small companies could no longer afford to uh, maintain as much inventory because that inventory was taxed, um, where it ne- might not necessarily have been prior to that. Uh, and that's surely a factor too that extends uh, affects wargaming, but affects everybody else as well that's operating at similar scales. Mm-hmm. Maybe not big companies, and where the expectation is that they will have a, a large amount of inventory on hand at any given time. Uh, sure. But you'll notice that, well, this is outside the scope of wargaming, but <laughs> manufacturing, large manufacturing uh, in this country, and I'm specifically talking about automotive operates mm. on just-in-time inventory. So they don't sit on a lot of parts. They got parts in for the day and sometimes the shift. And if, yeah. if somebody's, if the, if the truck's late, yes, they shut the production line down and they, they bill the people who didn't get the parts to them on time. So, yeah, for, yeah so that's a, that's a disaster. Uh, but, but in any case, <clears throat> I, I, there, there, I, I will certainly agree that the, easy facility with which we can and have been able for some time to just order what we want, whether that's directly from the manufacturer or buying it on eBay or looking at, you know, a variety of third party sellers, uh, of which a number of exist, uh, or the BGG marketplace or any of the mm-hmm. gaming marketplace, Facebook groups, or, or there's a, a, a bewildering array of, of places to get war games, new stuff. And in some cases, ancient, sometimes it's super obscure things pop up from time to time. So so I really feel like um, I could kind of get any, I mean, assuming I'm willing to spend the money, um, because it might be expensive, but I, mm-hmm. I can basically get any war game I want at this point. I don't have to, sure. you know, if I, if I really want a copy of La Grande Guerre from Azure Wish, I can, I can go order that from Noble Knight right now. That's true. And there's a good point, too, is what's changed with the average person can't impulse buy a paper war mm-hmm. game at many retail locations. Back in the day, they did carry those. I mean, I do remember them seeing those on the shelves at the Toys R Us. The Mm -hmm. in New Jersey, where I grew up, there was another company called Child World. uh, Was another one that sold games and sold uh, toys for kids. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing those there, along with the Star Wars figures. Yes, the original Star Wars figures, Mm -hmm. not the new stuff. And uh, but that has changed over the years, and wargaming has kind of fallen off the you know, edge of the world for gaming. That used to be the big thing. And now it kind of fell off the the world, you know, the edge of the world for gamers because now all, you know, your ticket to rides and all that stuff has, has mm-hmm. superseded that because they're more family friendly. That's why when you tell people you play war games, they're like, you do what? <laughs> you know, you kind of get that weird look like what's a war game? 34 years, 30 or 40 years ago, you'd said you're in a war game. We'd be like, Oh, cool. What do you got? Let's come on, come on over. Let's play. It was a different, it was a different time. But again, it's the same same games. I mean, there's the same games. Obviously, there there have been changes, but it's essentially the same thing as it was 30, 40 years ago. Some improvements, um, many improvements in many ways, especially in production values and things like that. But um, I think, like you were saying, to go back to the original point of this whole thing is we're poised in a really good spot right now. Uh, hobby Wargaming is very strong and it's just going to get stronger. It's actually... Uh, expanding now because it isn't just 
um, war games, but you've got hobby or I say historical board games too, that are adjacent that are expanding as well, that are bringing more people in. And then hopefully those people will go from their, you know, strategy game into a, a deeper strategy game with a war game. And just like war gamers will go and check out a lot of the strategy games, you get that crossover and that's where you get that blending of ideas and mechanics and things like that. Um, so I think, I think right now though, we're really in a good spot. Um, I, I will say that I find it, uh, uh, it's, it's a special moment when you walk into a brick and mortar game store and you see war games there. That's that's relatively <laughs> uncommon, and it's even more uncommon to see something that's not from GMT, right? Because they're yeah. the, the most dominant player o- operating in that hobby wargaming space right now. And we've seen over the course of uh, the past several years that they've, you know, they're kind of inching their way outside that hobby game space to try and kind of take up more more of the space that Avalon Hill did in the past, where yeah, they have war games, but they also have this huge line of sports games and general mm-hmm. interest games and family games and party games and stuff like that. Now, I don't know that I'd ter- be terribly interested in putting a P500 in for a party game that GMT did, but you never know, <laughs> right? Um, well, if you put a P500 in for Tank Duel, that's pretty much a Wargamer's party game. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, at a, at a convention. For a war game, yeah. For I, a war I would game, agree yeah. with that. I think that the true Wargamer's party game is actually Kevin Sonar. Oh, yeah. No, that, that is great. But that can also be... Uh, and if you've not played Captain Sonar, we both heartily recommend this game. Oh yeah, um, it is. It, it it could be a party game for sure, but you get like eight people that are serious about it, mm-hmm. and it gets pretty intense. It's it high gets intensity. Really, really fun game. It, it is a real fun game. So uh, don't play if, it at two in the morning in your thin walled apartment, though. No, no, because your neighbors will be calling the cops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, that that one is definitely a lot of fun. Um, now, do you guys, before we go any further in this, do you guys have any questions, not just comments, but do you have any questions, especially if you are from the practitioner space, not familiar with hobby war games as much as you may like to be or want to be? So let us know if you have any direct questions we can assist you with, and we'll list, look for those, and the producer will put them up there for us, and then we'll just continue on. But we want to make sure that we get... Um, those questions answered because there's a lot of, there's been a lot of questions back and forth between hobby gamers and pr- practitioners. Like what's the difference between the professionals and the hobbyists. And I think there may be some, um, well, maybe a lack of knowledge the other way too, at times, because what practitioners do is, is similar in some ways, but very different in many ways from what you see, um, in the hobby war game space versus a practitioner, the sweet spot for price and war games currently two hundred and fifty dollars. Depends. <laughs> it really depends. Uh, I think the sweet spot is me personally. The sweet spot would be about sixty to eighty dollars, but that is hard to do, uh, depending on the component count and you know rule book size, all that stuff. I know that may sound silly, but if you have a rule book that's 10 pages versus a rule book that's 50 or 60, 50 or 60 means there's a lot more work that went into it versus 10, 10 pages. And I'm not saying that it's easier to do the 10 page, but I'm just saying there's a lot of development and things like that. So that also does, I believe, play into some of the cost for the, uh, for, for the sales price, I should say, not just the component uh, prices, but, you know, war game companies, the publishers are in business to survive and to exist and to thrive and they're doing that right now uh but yeah i mean obviously we all want cheaper <laughs> what well, about you yeah. I, i'm a i, I mean that, to be honest I'm, I'm somewhat ashamed to admit this but I, I seldom walk into a brick and mortar store anymore because chances are uh while there are exceptions <laughs> even in in ohio there there there's not exactly a giant selection of war games on the on the shelves at the local game stores Right. Mm. Um, so I like to save a buck or two when I can as well. Um, but I, one one thing I'll point out is that uh, there there are different economies of scale between different levels of publisher within hobby wargaming, too. Sure. Right. So so uh, a game with just looking at the, you know, the components on the back of the box yeah, you might see it's got a 16 page rule book and a paper map and two sheets of counters. And that game from GMT is likely to be something like forty eight dollars. That game from Multiman Publishing is more likely to be something like seventy-five or eighty-five dollars, mm-hmm. but 
uh, GMT is printing in larger print runs. They're printing offshore, which saves them money as well. And I, uh, I'm sure I have enormous sympathy for the folks at Multiman who continue to print yeah. uh, in the United States to this day, uh, because everybody else uh, is reporting that they have a lot of problems actually making that happen at all, let alone reliably. So, yeah. so different publishers, each publisher will kind of have its own way to price things. Which is not to say that somebody's gouging, right? Uh, that's just to say that their operate, their economics might be different from somebody else's economics based on the number of copies they print or the number amount of research that they do or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. It's very true. So, what Palm Mill games would you recommend that have mechanics that might interest professionals? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. That's like saying to me, uh, recommend me a war game. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, what area are you into? What mechanics are you into? In this instance, it would be what mechanics are you liking uh, over uh, others, for example. I mean, there's uh, several different Palm Mill games that would give you like Versailles 1919, or is it 1919? Yeah, it was yes. 1919. That one, Churchill, Pericles is another one. Those are three right there off the top of my head. You want something a little lighter and faster? Uh, what is it? Uh, Flashpoint South China Sea. I couldn't mm. think of it there for a second. That's another one that's fairly quick moving. Twilight Struggle is another one that's mm -hmm. got a kind of a palm mill feel to it. It's a pretty straightforward CDG, area control CDG. Um, interesting game if you're interested, especially if you're interested in, in the Cold War. It is a type of game, though, after if you have not played it, it's going to be awesome for like the first 10 or 20 games because you're mm -hmm. going to feel like you're exploring this gigantic world. And then after you played it like 10 or 20 times, it really shrinks and you realize it's about the deck. It really is all mm -hmm. about the deck. Then it becomes a game of chess. And if you like chess and you like the memorization of moves and, st and stuff like that and re remembering cards, you're going to love it. If you don't, that's where the game will go stale for you. But it's mm -hmm. good for at least 10 to 20 games. <laughs> if Which is more. pretty good. Which is really. awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Of the and you can play it digitally too. That's true, too. There's an excellent digital adaptation of it. Same deal with Labyrinth, actually. Yes. So of all the kind of games you mentioned there, um, uh, specifically Churchill uh, for Sign 1919 and um, Pericles, Pericles of, the, of those three, and I think this will probably be true of the upcoming Congress of Vienna as well, which I'm super into, by the way. Um, uh, of the those, uh, Pericles has the biggest war game aspect mm -hmm. to it. There's the, the most significant military component to it. The a lot of the military things that are happening in Versailles 1919 are disarming from World War One, right? Sure. Uh, a lot, although there's some like military stuff getting pushed around as well. Twilight Struggle is the same deal. It's like, oh, the Vietnam War. I play this card. That was the Vietnam War. Right. Um, so uh, there's there's not like you're, you're not going to get detail or analysis out of that individual proxy war for in, in that specific example uh, in a game like Twilight Struggle. So. Well, that's very true. You know, another great line uh, that uh, I'll throw out there for Paul Mill, which is uh, probably the the best in that regard, it's similar to Pericles, would be the coin series, because yes. that is very much a two to four player game that because there are some that are two, there's just one, I believe that's three, the rest are, you know, up to four. Mm -hmm. And that really is all about the the give and take the negotiation and, you know, heavy handedness that you can, you can try to impose on your, you know, partner, uh, mm -hmm. to try to gain points because that's what that game is all about. That's what that series is all about is, is gaining points. So there's, there's combat in it, but it's very abstract. It, it's not a very heavy war game. You feel at all, mm -hmm. but it's more about manipulating, uh, the situation around you and how to, try to best stave off, which is the, the interesting part of twilight struggle is how to hold off or how to stave off the, the bad cards mm -hmm. while maximizing the good ones. And, you know, and you can actually pass with coin. You could say, you know what, that one is not going to be good for me. That one will be better. So you can kind of play a little bit behind the scenes and it really does capture the whole posturing and just the cutthroat backstabbiness of the whole mm -hmm. counterinsurgency strategy, which I think mm -hmm. it captures very well in that regard. Mm -hmm. And if you want a, a, a political military uh, experience specifically, I do think coin and games kind of operating in the same space as coin. And I'd, I'd include labyrinth in one of those 
are good choices mm -hmm. uh, with the caveat that some of the, there's a, a pretty wide range of, of complexity in coin games. Some of them are really very simple. Some of them are fairly detailed. Um, and uh, another thing, though, is that many contemporary conflicts have been and can potentially be covered by coin because of the nature of the way that system works. Mm -hmm. uh, then are necessarily easy to transfer to a say a hex encounter war game or something similar to that, right? The Vietnam War is is the most obvious example. Very yeah. difficult topic uh, to you know at sort of the macro level of uh, here's the map, it's Vietnam. Um, yeah. It's it's pretty difficult to run a simulation of that, right? Um, and that's why we've seen very little of those, and and most of the ones that we have seen uh, are. They all the examples, except for Fire in the Lake, which kind of sits in the middle of this space, um, are either really simple and abstract or um, are really simmy, really simmy and detailed, like the Nick Carp uh, Vietnam 65 Vietnam 75, 75 from, yeah. from Victory Games and then now from available from GMT, which is a classic. You know, it's really the only game like it. Um, mm -hmm. Fire in the Lake is like one of the only things that kind of sits in the middle of that. Either you're either doing hearts and minds, which is just kind of pushing cubes around or whatever, yeah. um, or you're you're doing Vietnam 65 to 75 and playing it for the next two and a half years, um, or you could do Fire in the Lake in four to four or five hours. So yeah, it abstracts all that stuff that Nick did mm -hmm. really in detail mm -hmm. that you really have to you know drill down into. He he abstracts it out to where you can play it in for you know four five six hours in an evening mm -hmm. and get the full experience and then they've even got the expansion you know uh, the, i think don't they have a second expansion coming out for that too yes there yeah. is there so there are actually two expansions out one of which is the solitaire bot the solitaire the and then follow saigon is out as well i think it's follow saigon and then there's another yeah. one coming that will deal with the early part of the war before 19 uh, well but what up to whenever um uh Fire in the Lake takes over, which yeah. I think is might not be 1965, actually. Uh, these are games I like a lot, actually. Um, these are, however, very heavy hex encounter uh, war games in, in both cases. Yeah. Uh, Days of Decision, uh, less so if you play it by itself, but it is it is more commonly used as a pre-war, uh, pre-game for World in Flames, which covers all of World War II globally. Uh, at a very detailed level and is probably looking like a hundred or 150 or 200 hour game to play. So that's, that's a pro you're signing. It's a fabulous game, but you're signing up for a project. Yeah. And then, you know, about the political aspects in games mm -hmm. in war games, I would say that those are probably even more abstract than the combat is in coin because, or about as abstract. Now it's probably equal when you think about it, because in coin, it's more about the positioning and the political maneuvering and leverage you're trying to get, um, and pressure, not kinetic combat, you know, mm -hmm. not kinetic conflict, mm -hmm. um, compared to the war games that have the kinetic warfare with the politics added on. And it's kind of very light, you know, very simple abstract. So it has an effect and it has a feel, but it's not something you're going to drill down into too heavily. Mm -hmm. So if you want Paul Mill, it's like, do you want, which one do you want to lean more towards mm -hmm. political or military? Because you know, that's they're... a continuum, right? Yes. There's, yeah. Uh, you can have, uh, and it's not, it's not only not binary where a game is either political or military, but you have two separate dials where you could turn the political all the way up and the military all the way up, and then you end up with a world at war, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to, you could turn it all, also turn it all the way down, and you end up with something like. Uh, a game whose name I cannot recall at this time, which is a very simple, playable in two hours World War II in Europe game, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can get like, you know, Triumph and Tragedy where it's more of a sandbox and you can do political yeah. and the military, or you could do the war and the war mm -hmm. Pacific, which has political, but it also is is very heavy on the combat and things mm -hmm. like that. But also you, you got to deal with um, buying, you know, not manufacturing, but like your logistics and mm -hmm. stuff like that more so than... Uh, than you would in say something like uh, unconditional surrender was the other one I was trying to get at with the politics and also as mm -hmm. manufacturing as mm -hmm. well as combat, but it, that's still lower than what you'd get from the military. So you're getting more of a heavy military there mm -hmm. than politics. Yeah. So, so each individual is going to need to figure out where on those dials, yeah. their preferences fall. Right. And chances are pretty good that there's something out there for them. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we have also seen, as I think you already mentioned, uh, a, a lot of interesting topics that would have otherwise been difficult to cover, right? Yeah. In in games like uh, Land and Freedom, which was mentioned a minute mm -hmm. ago here, which is brand yeah. new uh, on the Spanish Civil War. Um, that is, a, there's there are a few games on it, but not that many. Um, and that's a that's a really important uh, conflict in the history of Europe, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and very impactful on World War II. As but well. it also looks at it in a different way than the other ones. Mm -hmm. The few that are out there, the the other ones are either point to point. I think there might be. Is, uh, is there a hex encounter? There is, but I know there's the point. The point was at mm -hmm. uh, Espana 1938. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is. Um, that that's like point to point. It's a standard mm -hmm. war game, but it's point to point. Mm -hmm. This one is more. This one would be more the Paul Mill kind of group. The people who want the Paul Mill would like that because it's more like coin in that you're dealing with the asymmetric factions and you all have mm -hmm. your own own goals, but at the same time you don't want to lose the war. Mm -hmm. So it's you're there. It's like that tug of war where we're pulling and pulling against each other, but at the same time, we're not pulling to the point where we lose the war because we're trying to win the war and guide the nation the way we want for our faction, which mm -hmm. is where I think it, it gets real interesting for people. And there's a lot of cards. And if you love card play, uh, CDG, that's definitely a game you'd want to check out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could think of at least four other games that, that cover the whole conflict. Um, one of which is a heavy hex encounter, one of which is a point to point game on the Paths of Glory model. Uh, Land and Freedom is, is just out, and I really haven't looked at it yet, other than mm -hmm. seeing pictures and lots of glowing reviews about it. Um, uh, Brotherhood, Brotherhood Unity. Unity is an interesting uh selection as well. That yeah. is about the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, it is also a point to point card driven game, uh, mm -hmm. not, not terribly complicated, terrific game. Uh, mm -hmm. And a very bold choice of designer who is from that part of the world, right? Yeah. So who has firsthand knowledge of the events there uh, and who has helpfully provided us with a complete pronunciation guide to all the names on the map, which would <laughs> otherwise be completely opaque to me. Um, but yeah, uh, and that's fairly close to the Paths of Glory model as well, as I recall, but not uh, it's not as close as some other games have been. No, it's true. That's very true. Right. And, you know, when it comes to uh, Paul Mill, I think it is um, that is something that is probably more heavy for the practitioner's interest than the standard kinetic war game. Uh, because oh, very plausibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that seems to be more uh, along the lines of um, the, the games that the practitioners uh, participate in where you're you're coming up with situations and you're presenting a, uh, you're presenting a situation. If you're uh, running uh, the game, you're going to be presenting the situation. Everybody, everyone's going to have to give you verbal answers or follow through with different procedures. But then again, the practitioner is, is doing the game to ask, to find the right questions to ask mm -hmm. a lot of times, not necessarily like a war game where me and Gary sit down to play a war game. We want to get in there, start throwing punches and see who wins not not get come up with the right questions you know because mm -hmm. this is for entertainment not necessarily for uh, any deep thought that doesn't mean that war gamers don't dig deeply into war games because they do and you can you can get some people that give you some really detailed aars and do a lot of deep analysis on mm -hmm. on some of the games they play if they really really love it ocs is something that you love to play there's a lot of people that are really deep into that mm-hmm uh, and there, there are though uh, uh, a a variety of different reasons why hobby war gamers play hobby war games, mm -hmm. right? We are, as you said, fundamentally doing it about entertainment because we enjoy doing it, right? Or, or we would be doing our taxes, or mowing the yard, or doing the laundry, or whatever it is we'd otherwise be doing. That is presumably less entertaining. Uh, but I mean, there's there's people who do kind of view it. Their their entertainment is coming from the competitive nature of it. There are other people who really like to explore complicated rules, rules, right? And that's, I think, part of the reason why we've seen uh, a sometimes, uh, if not frequently, overstated propensity toward complicated rule sets in hobby wargaming. That's that's never been as true as some people seem to think, um, and it's not any more true now than some people seem to think. There's always been plenty of simple games around, and I we're on the same page with that as well. Um, there are other people who want to use a war game, particularly a historical war game, to engage with the history. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, 
uh, what Alec is talking about here. Uh, yeah. And that's that's kind of where I fall, right? I'm much less about uh, competitive play, and and I mean I like to win as any much as anybody else. Don't get me wrong, but sure. But for me, it's about engaging with with the history and with the model of that history that the game is presenting to me. Uh, to me, that's the more interesting thing. And everybody's once again going to have their own kind of outlook as to what they find fun in war games, right? Some people really love doing the production, right? Other people can't stand running the production and would never play a world in flames or a world of war because they've mm -hmm. got to, oh, I got these build points I got to spend on units every every three months or whatever <laughs> it is, right? Some people hate that. Um, yeah. Some people hate having to keep track of stuff on uh, paper. Uh, I kind of like that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I would have made an excellent accountant in a previous life. But <laughs> um, some people just Im immediately, it's a hard pass, right? So, so this applies to sort of the approach to the game, but also to mechanics, right? There's, uh, there, you're you're going to have mechanics that you just find not fun, as yeah. as do I. And we've gone over that, you know, in the past as well. So th there's just, there's always going to be room for like personal tastes and preferences as well, sure. uh, as well as the personal dimension of why we, I or you or who, a given individual plays war games as an entertainment as opposed to doing it because it's their job to do so or because it's the chosen vocation, right? Yeah. yeah, And, you know, it all depends too. This goes to that, to Alex, you know, comment about the, or question about people that want to study a battle or an, a theater or whatever. It goes also back to what we were saying before. There's such a wide variety of games now that you can probably find something that covers the area of interest that you have. Um, some areas Unless are it's a little the thinner. Pink and zero, then there's only one. There's yeah, I was going to say that would be the one exception. You know, um, no one's listening and getting that uh, another production of that game out there. A little pun there. Not but, not uh, going to be reprinted. <laughs> top three innovative war games or games in the last year. Wow, not like putting us on the spot. Innovative game. Yeah, I haven't given this any thought at all, Brett. You should have shut these lie. questions in advance. Yes, you should have. If you're going to try to dump a innovative, we have to think through our thing while we're trying to talk here. That's Is this one of those gotcha kind of shows? Difficult. Have we have Pretty we signed much. up for a gotcha show? That's possible. Your uncandid camera. Yeah, um, I, not quite the last year, but I would I would call Atlantic Chase, and uh, it's somewhat successor in this regard. Storm over, I forget whether what just Storm came over the Reich. Storm over the Reich. Mm -hmm. uh, both of which Jeremy White was involved in with Gina Willis on Storm over the Reich. Um, I would say U-boat. <laughs> and that's more than a year or two ago. I know. I'm just, but, that was more of a joke than anything uh, else. Well, you could play it through the app on your phone. That's yeah, very innovative, that's right? True. Only a million other games do that now. <laughs> uh, but in terms of presentation and stuff, and and it, yeah. I haven't looked at Storm Over the Right, but I do have it and have played Atlantic Chase, and it's it's quite novel. Mm -hmm. um, it's It'll be very interesting to see if folks pick up on that mechanism. There's also other like really novel and clever mechanisms that work really well that just nobody else picks up. Mm -hmm. um, other other ideas seem to spread like wildfire, like the 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 four asymmetric factions from coin games that every mm -hmm. every game now that has four asymmetric factions or some guy out there calling it a coin game, sure. even though no, there's there's four asymmetric factions. So what? There's like this list of thirteen mechanics that are typical of coin games, and yeah. that's that's the first bullet point on the list, and that's it. Everything else is different. So yeah, that's that's key. Is if if the other well also do the four are they four completely asymmetric or are they four that are asymmetric but two of them are kind of similar and yeah. the other two are kind of similar and are kind of yeah. working together but against each other at the same time yeah. while they're working against the other two yeah. and so, that varies from coin game to coin game too it does, right yeah. mm -hmm. so in, in some cases they're just four independent factions that maybe have some overlapping goals but uh, otherwise they don't care uh pendragon mm -hmm. is like that for example there's there's not yeah. strong natural alliances in Pendragon the way you would see in a distant plane, which is the war in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. or Fire in the Lake, which is the war in Vietnam, where you do kind of have four players on two sides with some conflict between them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they, they're not trying to bone the other person on their team either. Sure. Now, Unless they are, in which case <laughs> it's enjoyable for everyone else at the table. <laughs> That's true. It makes for uh, makes for a fun table to watch as those two go at it. But um, I would say innovative as far as most innovative or one of the ones I would consider most innovative. It's probably going to go past. What did, what did he say? The last year 
I would have to go uh, further back. That would be last hundred yards because I think that really took tactical gaming in a completely different direction. Instead of, you know, going out there and saying, okay, Hey, I'm moving my guy here. Do I have line of sight on your guy, Gary? And then we got to check the line of sight and then I shoot and then I either hit or don't. And then maybe one of your guys as I'm moving can op fire me and stuff like that. No, here, everything happens at once. You're moving your guys, you're moving your counters around and there's reactions and then there's other reactions. It's just a chain reaction of things that happen. Then you, and you put all your modifiers on the counters as you are resolving that one sequence. And then you mm-hmm. roll the dice and resolve everything. And then you advance the time. So, and it depends that time is it like every engagement in a tactical game might be 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, whatever in your standard tactical game here, it could be up to several minutes that this sequence took in real time. And that actually goes against you in the game because there's a time thing in the game. So that, that I think in so many ways, that is an innovative system. And the only thing that it is missing, in my opinion, is a better rule book because Mm -hmm. it is a difficult game for people to wrap their heads around. And I think that the rule book was better. It would be more approachable for a lot more people because it is an interesting, innovative system. So if you're going to go back as far as last hundred yards, I'm going to go back as far as the battalion combat series, which last Blitzkrieg released in 20, I believe 2016. Uh, which mm-hmm. we are playing right now. And it is an amazing uh, distillation of a lot of really important and powerful concepts that have been treated very concretely in previous games, uh, all kind of condensed down into one die roll and a relatively compact set of die roll modifiers on that one die roll. Um, very novel, also a relatively difficult rule book. But anecdotally, so one of our four people playing that right now, this is actually our current game on the table. Uh, one of our four people is complete, complete greenhorn. Never played a war game before. Um, and in in some way, he's picking things up very quickly. Now, we, we'd already been playing for like two months, two, three months before he brought, came on board, right? So so we're all relatively familiar with it at this point while mm-hmm. still looking up rules pretty much every week. Um, he's picked things up extremely quickly um, without having the baggage necessarily of, of, okay, well, I know Zox worked this way and I know, you know, this means that, this means the other thing. Um, so, so there is a sense at least in which, uh, it, it being a, like experienced in the, the field of hobby war games will help you. Uh, but there's also s- situations in which it can be a bit of a hindrance too, when you have to really sure. learn entirely new and alien concepts, um, that you just aren't familiar with because the designer's a genius and he's thinking on a different level than the rest of us. That's very true. No, that's, uh, it's. And, and it's fine to go back further if we have to, because it's it doesn't mean that every year there's a new innovative game. I want to go back out. to Anzio in 1965. <laughs> well, we should go all the way back to the beginning. The Kriegspiel. We could. We could. <laughs> Baron, uh, Baron von Reiswitz Kriegspiel. Yeah, exactly. You know, but as far as uh, when it comes to there was uh, Jeff was talking about Littoral Commander um, and the challenge being the assets you spend your limited resources on. Uh, which is an interesting part of that game. And uh, it is now available. Mm-hmm. It is actually at the Dietz Foundation. Mm-hmm. I placed my order the other day once I heard they got it in. There's Marines in it, right? Yes. Well, okay. no. it's it was originally Fleet Marine Force, mm-hmm. and then it was Littoral Commander because the Corps was like, no, you can't use the Marine Corps. Okay, well, Why not there's take Marines the in it, okay? Well, yeah, of course, there's Marines in it, so yeah, I have, right. I'm obligated. So it was a, it was an interesting thing, and uh, when I played it, and this is what one of the benefits of Wargaming, when I played it, it made me think, and I had talked to Sebastian about it a few times after. Uh, we had a couple really good long conversations about it. It made you think. It stuck with me afterwards about the, the potential problems for the MLR, uh, due to just playing that game. And this is where wargaming and actually playing war games in a hobby way versus the practitioner way, where you get resolution. You play a scenario, you play a couple scenarios, you have resolution, you see what happens. You go, okay, if this was real, here's the butcher's bill. We would have won the we would have won the battle, but we would have lost this, this, and this and this. The, we just, you know, we have two companies combat ineffective, or we have this many uh, platforms destroyed. 
versus what we took out. Okay, well, what was the cost? You can do a cost benefit analysis. I get it. Mm-hmm. I guess at that point, if you want to, but at the end, you really want to look at it and go, okay, this is what it would end up being. But how can we improve that? Maybe next time we use this instead with your assets. You know, we're talking about the the assets that you buy with your limited uh, resources. What about? And then you start thinking about what are the issues that you're going to have with supplying these troops that are on these islands, getting them to the islands, all these other things. So it it does create other questions too. But I think by having the resolution, which is different, similar but different, very different, because there's a combat resolution table. So mm-hmm. that one will give you an answer as to who lives and dies versus whoever is facilitating the event will tell you what happens. And I, and I, I like the, the, the definitive answer of a CRT. Now, of course, we'll argue with CRT till we're uh, blue in the face as far as the validity of it, but, uh, there's, there's still justification, but I think that's where the benefit of playing hobby war games can help practitioners as well, because you can get in there. You can just in two, three, four hours, you have a definitive answer as to what happened. Now, wh- then you can do a postmortem on it, you know, an AAR and say, okay, did this happen because I, I sucked and I did really bad things or was it because maybe I was overplaying my hand? I, I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And, and then you can analyze it a little bit more. And again, it creates more questions for you too. So hobby war games are valid and helpful. I think to the practitioner as much as uh, their games would be. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think that hobby war gamers can, uh, can teach pro war gamers are is how to argue with the referee about the rules yes so this is true <laughs> that's a thing that we're probably a little more prone to doing than the professional people because they're professional people and we're not so yeah um it, when it comes to um hobby war gamers though uh the interesting thing with the hobby war gamer versus a practitioner is when you play a game especially if it's something about a subject that someone really likes. Now, now every time you play a war game, doesn't mean you have deep knowledge or deep understanding oh, or no. an attachment to that theater or that battle. You might just want to play it for the heck of it. Mm-hmm. But if you sit down and you play something with somebody who is attached to that theater or that, that battle itself, they'll be like, yeah, you know, this isn't modeled right. Why is that? Well, cause on April 2nd, this is what happened at this time. And those units aren't anywhere near this this guy didn't do his, his research on the design. And you're like, okay. (laughs) So, I mean, there's that too. Uh, you get that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've, we've, I mean, we've all certainly seen that where you can argue with, with the game about, uh, historicity uh, as well. And you know, that's something that, uh, maybe all games are not quite as airtight as we would like them to be. Um, I do think that, um, there's, this is, this is from my point of view, and I think you're probably going to disagree with me on this. I feel like there's a there's a there's a weight in hobby wargaming towards historical topics, as opposed to modern hypothor or near future hypothetical mm-hmm. topics. Um, that certainly seems to be the case to to me. Uh, you've got a better eye and a greater interest in those near future, modern, and hypothetical topics than I do, though. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot more in the, in the historical because it's easier to make a historical game. The data is not classified. Yes. It's easier and harder at the same time because it's easier because most of the, you know, the, the stuff that you can get, the, the OBs and everything are out there. Maybe not to the extent you'd like them and more keeps getting found all the time. They keep finding more data all the time over the years. So that is easier. It's also harder because now you have to transfer that into the idea of the design you have and chart it out to follow the historical outcome as close as you can without making it scripted. You want it to be, so you want it to follow along without making it just like a complete rehash of the battle. It's like, all right, the game plays itself. What's the point? <laughs> I can watch Gettysburg if I want to just watch Gettysburg. Exactly. I, don't need to, I don't need to play the game. Right. But you want to still have the the room to explore and like, well, mm-hmm. if they didn't do this on this day and they did that. So it has to you have to walk a fine line there where it's easier for the the near future or the hypothetical is no one can tell you you're wrong. You know, it, well, this is this is how I envision this is going to be mm-hmm. based on this data that I have. And it's not all declassified. This is what I have from OSINT mm-hmm. or whatever. So 
that is easier, but it's also harder because things change. Perfect example, next war, the next war series. Well, next war, you have India, Pakistan, you have Taiwan, you've got Korea, you've got all these games, Poland, anything with the Marines in it is, has to be redone now because now you, they, they changed the Marine Corps. They took out armor. And now they have the MLR to say so, nothing of anything with Russians in it. it not even going there yet. You know I mean? I, so it's like you, you're fine that, Oh, well, uh, and I was, that was my next thing. I was like, well, we've we got to change this because the, the, the Marines have changed their policy with, you know, force design 2030. So now we have to change how we model that in the game. Because people are going to go, wait a minute, this is so 10 years ago, <laughs> and this is yeah. supposed to be in the future. And then, of course, you have the whole Russian situation, like mm -hmm. with Poland. I've got the errata here for Next War Poland, which says, mm -hmm. uh, take the Russian counters and throw them in the recycling. Bin. <laughs> <laughs> because you're always, you're always guessing yes. when it comes to that. Uh, you're, you're doing your best guess. Now, there's something to be said about the Russian values not being accurate to today. However, we don't have a full right after action on Ukraine, Russia right now, mm -hmm. which will take years to analyze. Mm -hmm. So you may find that it's not as bad as we thought, or it's worse. One of the two, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Same could be said for China. We have no data on China. It's, it's all supposition. It really is. Uh, you're basing it on platforms and you're basing it on platform capability. You, it's hard to base it on uh, the human aspect, how well will they perform in combat? You know, it's, you, it's a far cry from, uh, you know, sticks and stones when it was at the Korangawa Valley versus out in the South China sea against the U S. So it, it there, that right there opens up a lot of room for debate mm -hmm. that that's where it gets harder, you know, for the, for the modern designer. So mm -hmm. there's pros and cons to both. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, there are, there are soft factors like leadership mm -hmm. ability that are hard to quantify anyway. Yeah. And it becomes even gr more gratuitously, obviously wrong if you get it wrong, right? Make, make assumptions. In, in some cases, you're going to have to make assumptions. All those designers of uh, SPI uh, near future hypothetical games in the late seventies and early eighties, a lot of their stuff was based on guesswork. Um, mm -hmm. and in some cases they may have guessed uncannily accurately. And in other cases, they the, the, the data was pulled from a, a suspicious orifice. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeff, I, that would be a question for Mitch land as far as, uh, anything with next war, Ukraine, you know, Ukraine, Russia, I, I don't expect to see that from him. He said no himself. Um, so, I mean, the next one is going to be Iran. So mm -hmm. that is the next one that's in development right now. Uh, as far as a Russia Ukraine war game right now, this has been talked about back and forth a bunch of times. Again, I go back to what I said. You really can't do a war game on something that's it, it's hard to do a war game on for a hobby game on something that is taking place right now. Mm -hmm. It's been done, though. It has been. Um, but the thing is, is. Again, practitioner needs versus hobby war game. Mm -hmm. The hobbyist is going to sit there and go, oh, this is completely unbalanced or this doesn't, this didn't end up historically accurate. It's like, well, number one, war is not always balanced and you don't want to go into war balanced. You want to go into war with the, the upper hand always. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not always the way it works, but, and it's hard to model, uh, make a game, a commercial game on something that is ongoing or is very recent be, without having exhaustive data on it mm -hmm. and it takes years for that data to come out i think mm -hmm. there are several games on the topic in development well, yeah. about several but at least oh, a yeah. couple games on the topic in development mark's got one i know mark's got one yeah. and i suppose given the history you know there the history of mark not the history of the conflict uh if, if there's anybody that can pull that off based on sheer gut instinct and genius uh it's probably mark so sure so there's that but uh, but yeah, I mean, I'd be, is I his would one approach... about the current situation or is it about 2014? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I thought it was the current situation, but I'm yeah. kind of not fully in the loop on it either. So mm. it's also not the whole thing. Yeah. So... Just one battle, I think. Yeah. Oh, so that's what it's battle of Kiev. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. You can, you can have one battle, but then yeah. you have to have it just be between a certain time span. You know, yeah. this is that's the battle. A between these two weeks or three weeks mm -hmm. or whatever, not where it is right now in 2023. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's a very bold, you know, as a design choice. That's very bold uh, of 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 any designer to to try and d uh, construct a model of a conflict that is still ongoing. Yes, um, there are not a great number of of examples of that. Um, this is going to be one. Another one that we might say it fits that description would be Labyrinth, which came out mm -hmm. when the War on Terror was pretty much still going on. Um, uh, John Prado's design, Year of the Rat, and I believe seventy two or seventy three, when the Vietnam War was still going on. That's mm -hmm. that's a uh, that's a bold uh, piece of design work right there. Yeah, and there's uh, a comment right here, Dragoon Commander, whoever uh, that is. Yes, it's not. It is not who we thought it was. Uh, on the first anniversary of the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, our design covered the initial assault on Kiev. Uh, entering full scale. He's from the armchair Rangoons, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. The armchair Rangoons. So yeah, that will be interesting to see how that, how that one plays mm -hmm. out. Um, and of course, if it's Mark, everyone's going to take notice and want to play it. Yeah. And the question will be, and this would be a question I would, I would say to Mark as well, if he was here was, okay, how well do you think the game is going to be re received? How well do you think the game is going to be looked back upon five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, when more data comes out, you know, mm -hmm. because again, and nothing against his sources or, or whatever he's, he's using as his data, it takes time for all that stuff to come out and get more information on, because really mm -hmm. this thing is, should any game right now on Ukraine and Russia should be just subtitled the TikTok wars. Because that's really where everything, most of the data was coming out on TikTok for the longest time. So um, that's interesting because um, it's like I said, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough call to, to like do something on a game uh, on something that's sure. already happening. But but at the same time, uh, I think probably all professional practitioners who are involved in the design stage of professional war games and at least some hobby war game designers are designing a game around what they're trying to say or what they're trying to explore mm -hmm. so somebody like mark might be taking it uh, uh from the example of hey i'd really like to try to model this conflict to better understand what's going on Right. Sure. And I could find I find that to be a completely rational impetus for designing a game on the topic. Yeah. Um, and that would that would need to, something you brought up a couple minutes ago. That one would definitely need to model in leadership. Oh, you'd think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and windows. Yes. <laughs> but then you have something when it comes to hypotheticals where you have somebody who does something like uh, Bruce Maxwell or. um Fabrizio Vianello and Tony Morfit, what they do with their games, Aaron Armour, NATO, next uh, Cold War Goes Hot. Then you have the 1985 series and C3 series. Those guys really dive real deep into that. And even though it's hypothetical, they get the OBs of, of the units that were in that area at mm -hmm. the time. And then they build from there and, uh, and they go different. They're, you know, they provide different things. NATO is totally different than what you're going to see in Aaron Armour. Mm -hmm. And 1985 is different than what you're going to see in C3, but, and 1985 is a little more war game and C3 is kind of leans more towards simulation. Same for NATO. Aaron Armour is still a game, a war game, but it's going to have more of a kind of a, more of a simulation feel to it. Um, it's going to be a, a different, more deeper game. And those are on a war that never happened. You know, the, the, uh, the third world war in 1985 mm -hmm. sandboxy type game. Sure. True. Uh, that's a, that's another uh, interesting highlight of a difference between a professional uh, war game and a hobby war game, though, um, yeah. is that the professional war game is almost by definition uh, it, it created to teach or illuminate. Right. Whereas the the hobby war game is fundamentally uh, built as to be an entertainment Um with variations for people who are entertained by different things, right? Some people love keeping track of having the notebook and keeping track of all the little numbers, like your bowl, mm -hmm. you're keeping track at the bowling alley. Um, other people hate that kind of thing. So, you know, sure. people have different levels of tolerance for that. But the, 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 the contrast there, I think is fairly interesting that, uh, that, uh, 
sometimes a, a hobby war game will be designed to illuminate some particular aspect of some particular topic, but not mm -hmm. always. A lot of times they're just meant to strictly as entertainments for whatever audience they're pitched to. True, true. Sandbox-like games would you recommend? One has already been mentioned, Triumph and Tragedy. Triumph and Tragedy. Um... Do not find yourself uh, moored to the historical uh, alliances mm -hmm. in that game. No. You will, not, you will probably end up having a miserable time if you do. You will flip the table and throw the box across the floor. Off the board. <laughs> and it's Pacific Companion, Conquest and Consequences. Conquest and Consequences. And then the other one that they did, uh, Cat Cataclysm, is similar to that. It's, uh, I think, more sandboxy. Yeah, not it's as it much looks as those like two, it. But it, that it's did not, that one did not work for me. It didn't I'm, work for me either. I'm, I'm willing to give it a second shot at some point, but it didn't work for me at all. Yeah, um, I, and, but there are people that really liked it, uh, and and it is supposed to be fairly sandboxy. The classic hex encounter example uh, of of sandbox World War II is, of course, World in Flames. Uh, it's often said about World in Flames. Uh, that's true too, but it's not a strategic sandbox in Europa. It's an operational sandbox. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different things you can you could try and do with it. The difficulty with that is you may try it, and it takes seven months to figure out whether what you tried worked or not True. and then if it didn't you have just tanked the game and you're either going to play something else or start over so that's true yeah so while while that's true and some a lot of people have in fact approached europa that way and i think that's a completely valid uh, outlook it's it's a it's a little a bit of a hard sell at this point not to mention the fact that the games are all 20 to 40 years out of print and mm. usually ruinously expensive that is a definite detractor. Um, now, I, I want to ask a question to the audience uh, for the practitioners there. Um, what hobby war games have you played? And try to give me two examples, if you can, something that you would say would be introductory or, you know, intro level, something simple, and then the most advanced war game you've ever played. And I want to see what you guys have played. And then we can kind of talk about that a little bit more, maybe give you a couple more suggestions or get a better gauge as to what you guys are playing from a hobby perspective, if you are. And if not, uh, post in there why you have not played any hobby war games. Is it your... I mean, have Dave you Java's seen hobby war busy? gamers? Holy cow. <laughs> Got to put up with us all the time. Yeah. Aaron brings up the thing about Tim Barrick's OSW system for the Marine Corps. That is one that I really want to play. I really want to check that, check that one out. Can be applied to other time periods. The TWW system. Third World War? No, not Third World War. That doesn't seem to make much sense to me, actually. Although, I will say that some of the mechanics in the Third World War, that we're talking now about the Frank Chadwick. I think it might War. be Second World War. Wait, wait, is that what he's talking about? Well, Jeff, what are you talking about with that one, TWW? Yeah, please explain. Please explain your acronyms. Because um, that's the first thing I think is Third World War. <laughs> that's me, too, because we're prepping it right now for June. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's that, that, that proficiency mechanic in there is actually another one of those mechanics that you'd think that would have caught on and just really hasn't. It works really well in that particular mm. game. Hey, so, he is talking about Third World War. Okay. Uh, right. So other time period, other hypothetical time periods in the same time period. Sure. Sure. Uh, there, yeah. there are multiple expansions in the works for it for mm -hmm. uh, various things, including Korea and uh, the rest of East Asia and Cuba mm -hmm. and some other stuff. So, yeah. Um, so the, the designers agree, but, but I think we're, I see the facility of that system as being relatively focused and narrow. Actually, I think it's mm -hmm. near future hypothetical uh, or, you know, past near future hypothetical, I suppose yeah. somewhere in that 1983 to 1980 maybe 91 range um, uh, of NATO versus Warsaw Pact stuff. It's designed for that. It works really well at that to uh, move it out of that format could be done, but you'd be basically designing a new game with a couple of shared mechanics at that point. Sure. But you'd have a framework to build on. You'd have to first thing you yeah. do is change OBs out and, you know, right. Go from there. Uh, it would obviously change because, you know, platforms have totally changed. Uh, there are some that are the same, but, uh, structure of the militaries have changed in many mm -hmm. ways so i mean you'd have a framework to work from but yeah it would, it would definitely dramatically change mm -hmm. but um i think he says read the designer's notes is what he's saying 
That's so really good advice. That yes, that would be a good one. I'll have to check um, that out now. <laughs> well, uh, in general, reading the designer's notes is, is really good advice. Uh, I often find that I read, that's the first thing I end up reading are the designer's notes. Because that's mm -hmm. going to give me some some insight as to how what the designer's trying to do here, right? Sure. I may encounter some element that just doesn't make sense to me because I'm not Mark D Mark Herman or Dean Essig or some you know highfalutin genius, right? Um, so the designer's notes are where the designer explains it to dullards like myself, um, and you know sometimes it's really illuminating to read those. And when when games don't have designer's notes, that that irritates me. Yes, yes, doesn't happen that often, but I have seen it. Home before the counters fade. Yeah, that's a class. <laughs> that's a, that's kind of an all time classic. Yeah, um, yeah not an all time classic, but it's it's kind of it's kind of a classic. Let me put it that way. Yeah, um, no. And it's a it's SPI an involved project before. too. Mm -hmm. now, this is not an involved project unless the project is the print and play version that's available on Board Game Geek. Um, it was intended as an introductory war game by SPI back in the day. They actually gave it away for free for a while. And uh, it's still kind of a classic. It still plays pretty good. It's simple. It's easy. It's got like 30 counters to it. So that's why they gave it away for free. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have Mark Herman, because we were just talking about him. He did his Waterloo system mm -hmm. in Gettysburg, which are uh, pretty, pretty simple too. You know, pretty easy yeah. to get into, pretty, pretty mm -hmm. um, easy to teach someone and sit down and play with that may not have played war games before. Mm -hmm. So the, those those games are fantastic for the simple fact that it's just ease of teaching, ease of playing. You want to play by yourself, you can do it. If you want to play with mm -hmm. someone who's never played a war game, it's not a challenge to teach them. Same with like SCS, talking about multi-man mm -hmm. before. Great system, what, seven, eight pages of rules. And then depending on the, on the, the game itself, you mm -hmm. may have another one to two or three pages of extra rules to add That's, in. Sometimes it's more. It's usually it's sometimes more pages, but, but it's uh, minimal. But yeah, it's, know, it's minimal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're talking a total of twelve pages of rules, that's yeah for for a hobby war game, that's considered pretty simple by hobby war gamers. Not necessarily by uh, by hobby board gamers, but by <laughs> hobby war gamers, that would be considered a a, a pretty simple game in, in almost every case. And once you've played one SCS game, and you pretty much know the eight pages. You just now you're just concerning yourself with the however extra many pages mm -hmm. there are for that new game that you're playing because mm -hmm. you know the base rules. Yes, the base rules stay the same, and then the other rules just alter or add or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, SCS is actually a little less unified than Dean's other systems. There's some kind of core elements that are left up to the game specific rules, like the specifics mm -hmm. of how stacking works. It's almost always the first yeah. actual rule I look up is well, how many how many counters can i put in this hex sure um uh varies from game system uh game specific rules to game specific rules mm -hmm. um sometimes the barrages too are, are different too plus there's other like uh transitional mechanics and a couple of scs games like the chip pull mechanic and panzer battles for example uh, which doesn't feature in any uh, any other game but but generally speaking uh, there are seven pages of rules in the series rules and you end up with something like four to six pages of rules in the game specific rules yeah. um and everything else in those books is a scenario of some kind and they're easy to play easy to teach um they will uh they are also good at teaching basic hobby war game concepts like zones mm -hmm. of control and uh you know ranges and how movement works and that kind of thing sure they're they're really ideal introductory games to the at least to the hex encounter space if that's where somebody wants to go specifically if they yeah. want to go more toward the Paul Mill stuff, then I tend to recommend something more like Churchill or Labyrinth or something like that. Yeah, no, that would definitely be more for it. Um, as far as uh, when it comes to advanced games now, we've got a couple of introductory games. Does anybody have any other advanced games that you've played or would like to play? Mm -hmm. And if you've not played it, why have you not played it? I recommend Case Blue. Case Blue, if you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you can find it. Afford it. it. <laughs> you can find it. You might have to sell your car to afford it. Yeah, might but. have to give a kidney up or something mm -hmm. like that. But yeah, uh, that that is uh, one of those games that you can find, uh, but it, you're going to pay mm -hmm. unless you happen to luck out and go to someone's, I don't know, someone's estate sale and somebody's selling the mm -hmm. stuff. And they're like, I don't know yeah. what this stuff is. Twenty dollars. You can take the whole <laughs> box of stuff. 
they bought Case Blue, so they couldn't afford kidney dialysis, so they died, and now it's your opportunity to pick up Case Blue. Yeah, and you just end up, but here's a box of stuff. Take whatever you want, and you're like, wow, wow, oh, Case Blue. <laughs> you're like, all this for 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's great. But I have um, I have dreamlike fantasies about that kind of thing, Mo, I have to tell you. <laughs> I, I, I'm not even kidding. I have dreams about, about that mother load that you find at a garage sale or something like that. Oh, yeah. It is, has never happened. No, you hear about it for other people, but you've, you've never, um, yeah. you never do it, experience it yourself or rarely experience it yourself. Yeah, Although yeah. sometimes you'll get something close to it, you know? Yeah. I've never, never. I found 32 <laughs> SPI flats for a dollar total. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's not, nothing like that. I mean, I'm, I'm more likely to be hit by a meteor than for that to happen. This is true. Now, uh, I would say for um going back a second while we wait for uh, anybody wants to chime in with advanced games some other games that we can recommend as far as like intro what about especially advanced dungeons and dragons you can go to advanced dnd uh, master dnd <laughs> uh, but what i was going to say uh, any of the dozen odd organs they bought in the last three is Babatai de Bouchon. nope that would be something gary would know way more than me what jeff was saying about uh the napoleonic game there mm -hmm. uh so uh labatai de beauchamp is a magazine game it's it's the labatai system you know the big detailed mm -hmm. battalion level napoleonic system uh but it's a magazine game and it was it's super digestible it uses one of the five extant labatai rule sets um but it uses what i what i feel like is actually the easiest one to learn Mm. Uh, the premier rules for martial enterprises. Um, and it's a quite small Napoleonic battle in 1813, I believe. Might have, might be 1814. Um, and it's like an ideal platform to learn that system from, at least if you want to learn the premier rules. You can play it with the other rules too, but uh, yeah, you do. You do it's La, La Bataille, you pretty much do what you want. Speaking of sandbox, that's how La Bataille works. You pretty much do what you want. So that's true. You want to play with this rule set? Cool. You want to play with this other rule set? Cool. <laughs> you want to play with 70% of this rule set, 30% of this rule set, and 2% this stuff you just made up? Cool. <laughs> we, we'll do, you'll find that you'll, the community amenable to that. That's true. And then, you know, Dragoon Commander put up there for the youngster as a background on the flat packs, which you had mm -hmm. mentioned. So, yeah, it's. Um, when it, <laughs> I know youngsters make us feel old, yeah. uh, but when you look at the practitioners, you're like, yeah, I do feel old. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah no kidding. Oh, well, that's actually an interesting, that's actually a really interesting observation. There, there is a generational gap yes. uh, in, in between the practitioners, a lot of whom are quite young. They're relatively fresh out of school. Uh, mm -hmm. These programs that they're in or running or participating in are not necessarily programs that have been around forever. Uh, meanwhile, you got old guys like us, you know, going into to you know, you know we're we're on metformin now, right? So yes. uh, <laughs> the you know there is a generational gap going on here that may be in some sense contributing to a uh, lack of information flow between the kind of two sides of wargaming, if you will. Um, yeah, it, I just it, don't get what these kids are doing nowadays. <laughs> Damn Skippy, but it's true. It's true, and that's where I think uh, things like this here at Connections can. I mean, there's we've talked about this numerous times, but I'd like to see more movement on bringing together the hobby war gamers, the practitioners, and and doing a crossover, more of a, a cross training, for lack of a better term, uh, because I think they war game, as they say, um, they war game. And war game, and I, I use that term loosely when it comes to practitioners because they use it in a wider variety of ways than we do, mm -hmm. because they use it as a as an adjective, <laughs> as a verb. We, we ours is a noun. You know, it's like we're going to war game. We have a war game, and we're going to war game. You know, saying I'm going to war game is a verb. We know what we're doing with this game. We're taking this game. We're going to play the Battle of Gettysburg or whatever. Theirs is more exploration mm -hmm. and uh for good reason but i think they would be well suited to play the more organized self-contained war game to see what goes on there and maybe incorporate aspects of that into their war games so you can have some sort of deterministic outcome in portions if not the entire thing 
again, going back to what I had said earlier about, Hey, play this out and see, maybe we need to approach the plan differently. And you, you start teaching people how to plan in, in a, for a kinetic conflict. Now the war games that practitioners do are not always kinetic. There's a lot of political things like that, which is why the first question was what Paul mill game do we want to play? <laughs> but I think there, we need to see more crossover. I don't know how we can get that to, to happen, but I think we need to have um, more interaction between the two groups to kind of cross seed each other and, and help each other understand the other better and maybe get some ideas from that aspect of wargaming and add it into the hobby wargaming and then maybe take some of our pieces and put it into the practitioner side. Mm -hmm. and, and as well, uh, there may be cross pollination opportunities with the sort of broader space of historical or adjacent space of historical games that are, mm -hmm. are not war games per se, right? Sure. Uh, a game that uh, reflects a strictly political situation is not a thing that I will normally call a war game, uh, but it may uh, it may be showing us something very valuable, or it may be showing us something in an interesting and novel way that could be uh, adapted for other purposes. Right. True. So there's interesting mechanics on all kinds of historical games that have floated around, and and all of them are in Europa Universalis: The Price of Power, from what I hear. Mm, so, it's the big beefy box yeah it's supposed to be uh i have i have heard that it is the most complicated game that people have ever seen i don't yeah. believe that for a <laughs> moment but uh that is that is the 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 direct quote that i have heard mm. so jeff brings up a good question he says hobby war gamers are often natural red teamers discuss you mean they're argumentative and are out to get you i uh, I, I concur we like to fight. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot of aspects to that. Um, when it comes to development of a war game, uh, that's where red teaming is best because you're trying to break the model. You're trying to mm -hmm. break the game, uh, which is what a red teamer is want to do is break in and break through and stuff like that. So in that aspect, uh, red teaming is great for development when it would come to, um, a war game. Now, are you talking about a hobby war game or are you talking about the, the professional the practitioner side? Because from a hobby war game perspective, if I go into a practitioner's war game, I'm like, okay, where do we fight? You know, that would be where I would be like, okay, what are you talking about? Okay. Are you going to do this? You're going to do that. Okay. I'm immediately going, where can I attack? Where's the weak point? That's what I'm going to, I'm going to go on the offensive. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to negotiate. That's for other people. I'm here to fight. So I'm going to look for the opening to try to punch, you know, and start going in. Uh, Napoleon that would be, would be very happy with you. <laughs> I mean, that, that that's what, that's the way a war gamer, most war gamers will think. I, I would, I would think is we're looking to attack. Where's the weak point? Where can we, ex, you know, expose you and, and get in there and uh, get into your, to your rear area and just completely decimate you if possible and try to stop you from attacking me. So that would be one area you uh, go with your idea on red teaming. Um, so in the sense that I'm not sure I agree with, with, I mean, there's a sense in which I, I agree with what Jeff is saying here, right? Because the, the hobby war gamer is approaching a game. I, I think generally speaking, there are people who will, who will do differently, right? There, there will, you're always going to find that person who's going to always wants to play the Germans or always wants to play the South mm -hmm. or always wants to play the Union or always wants to play the Dark Elf Ranger, right? But uh, other than that, hobby war gamers are generally going to approach a game from both sides because they could play either side, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, solitaire games are an ex exception. Um, so the professional war game isn't necessary. There might not be a red team, right? Um, there's always a red team. Or, well, it, there might be, but if the there's up, if it's opposed, there has to be a red team. Well, maybe it's not a well. Well, then maybe maybe that's not what I mean. Uh, if the if, if it's I guess it's then it's more of an exercise or command exercise, I suppose, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Of. Um, but the, the hobby war gamer is going to naturally try to kind of see it from both sides where, which is the, where we're purple team, not red teamers. Yeah. So the, 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 
some people participating, if you're bringing in, and, and this is probably true of the professional practitioners as well, by the way, um, but not necessarily of the participants. The participants are probably not thinking of themselves as the red team, right? Yeah. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. You're always blue. Yeah. Where a <laughs> From hobby your own war gamer is going to be like, hey, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to play. Let's let's play third Reich or let's play Russia campaign. I, I don't know. You want to play the Soviets? I, I don't know. You want to play the Soviets? You want to play mm. the Germans? Whatever. You don't know who you're going to play. So rather different situation there, right? Role playing the sides is a good point. Now, when it comes to if it, if it came down to a war game where you brought in um, hobby war gamers to a professional war game and you said, Gary, you're going to be the U.S., Mo, you're going to be China. Uh, I would think not from a, a U.S. perspective, I would say, OK, if I'm supposed to be playing the China role, then I'm going to look at China doctrine. I'm going to follow what we know about their doctrine. I, I'm going to do what they would do. Mm -hmm then I would maybe freelance a little bit and do something that I've heard that they might do, or I think they might do, but I'm going to play that role out because that's what I would see my function as in that exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and again, though, I would try to freelance a little bit because you can't, if, if you just follow a script, it's really not much because you're not going to learn much. Blue team's not going to learn enough unless they're stressed and they're kind of a curveball to run at them here and there. So in that regard, yeah, I agree that I think war gamers would make great role players because we would dive deeper into that than um, maybe the practitioner would because they're kind of looking at it a little differently. We're looking at how to win, mm -hmm. which whatever side you're, you're, you know, told to play as. So I think in that regard, it would be interesting to see. Yeah. I think the potential certainly there. I'll, I'll agree with that. <laughs> Brant saying he doesn't want me exposed. I don't want me exposed either. Thank you very much. No, we're not. This is a family friendly <laughs> show. Brant coming in here and giving us that nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Way to bring the show down, Brant. Yeah. Who let that guy in here anyway? Oh yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's like moose milk or something in there. <laughs> don't choke. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, we're professionals here, folks. Yes, don't, we are. Don't try this at home. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to red teaming, I think that would be great. And maybe that's something that uh, practitioners can maybe recruit some war gamers for, uh, hobby war gamers, just to see, hey, you know, we need uh, maybe if you have a kinetic aspect in your game, especially if you have that, that you want to have the war gamers play out. I'll and send the DOD my salary requirements. Exactly. I do it in a heartbeat. But it would be cool to do that and maybe hand that off to the war game side. You know, mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, the, the hobby war gamers say, you know what? You guys like doing this. You guys do that and report back. You know, I think that'll be kind of cool. Introductory. And, and, and afterwards, in the AAR, the, the professionals are going to be like, these guys are crazy. They're nuts. <laughs> but all, another thing, too, which I think is a good way. We don't do this as war gamers generally. But I think it is interesting if war games it's because war games are not designed this way. Hobby war games, hobby war games are basically you take this objective or you take that objective by turn, whatever, and you win or you don't win. So we'll throw anything and everything at our opponent to punch a hole, get to that point to win the game. We don't care that we just lost 30,000 guys. It's just cardboard. We don't, we're not thinking that where you would flip the switch is if you said minimal impact, minimal casualties, is what you want to, you want to not lose guys. And when you have a unit that goes in and fights, you cannot just keep that same unit running mm -hmm. all the way through to the end because it's a piece of cardboard and it doesn't get tired. No, there needs to be fatigue. There needs to be human factor involved um, to where it's like, okay, these guys have been in continuous operations for 72 hours or 48 hours. They need to be pulled back. Mm -hmm. Now that adds bookkeeping, you know, to the, to the mix where I think war gamers would, you know, some would balk at that and say, I don't care about that. I just want to play. But that's a, another important piece. I think that we are missing from war games, but th there's a valid reason. It's a game. Well, there are, there are games that take that into account. There right? are some. Yeah. Uh, G G uh, the great campaigns of the American civil war series, mm -hmm. for example, almost always, there's no like explicit rule for this as such, 
But almost every scenario has built into the victory condition some kind of casualty track yeah. where the Union player gets uh, two victory points for every Confederate manpower point they kill, for example, or or that the Confederate player stupidly loses potentially. Yeah. Um, so the so that can be a factor, but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times mm -hmm. it's just it's just cardboard. And if you got the job done and won, it doesn't really matter how many little cardboard guys you lost. Yeah, and that's where I, I, to me, I find tactical games draw me more in because I'm losing a squad and I feel that pain a lot more mm -hmm. than I lost half that division in the other game. It's mm -hmm. just, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, the way you approach the game, how you're mentally approaching the game. Is it just an exercise or you kind of put yourself in the commander on the, on the ground? When you do it at a tactical level, you are putting yourself on your boots on the ground with your guys. Uh, and you're seeing the squads on the counters, you know, or a single man unit, whatever. When it's operational, you, oh yeah, we just lost a half a regiment or whatever. It, it's, well, it well, went from a five to a four that you're thinking math, mathematically only tactical level you're seeing it and you feel the effects a lot greater because it's more concentrated. It's a smaller area. So that loss of that squad really will impact your firepower as the continue as the battle continues so um that that's another aspect of it too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh jeff beeler mentions as a simple game and i actually will, will broaden this statement that jeff has made mentions desert victory as a potential introductory game mm -hmm. um and it and it certainly is that's a trevor bender design in the latest issue of c3i magazine um a lot of those C3I magazine games are actually very well positioned to be introductory uh, or low, let's call them low maintenance war games. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, though, uh, the 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 calculus is different between the professional practitioner and the hobby space in that um, we're, you know, us hobbyists are doing it presumably because we enjoy it. I, I talked about this on a recent stream actually in that i think just strict complexity is like the, only the like third most important factor in in uh, picking an introductory game more important is well how are you going to experience this are you going to be playing it with your buddy that you already play games with mm -hmm. um are you going to be you know do you have a a, a mentor or teacher to teach you the game that's hugely valuable and are you interested in this kind of topic, right? Um, if I'm just not interested in ancients, it doesn't really matter how simple or complicated the game is. I'm just not going to, if I'm not going to engage with it anyway. True. So that engagement, uh, which is a, a combination of factors, in, including complexity, but but also, you know, the person's individual interest and, and the, the enthusiasm of somebody that's potentially teaching them are all factors that go into engagement and it's the engagement that is the desirable thing for an introductory war game at, in the mm -hmm. hobby space rather than necessarily finding the simplest available game. true you know a, a great example of that um when it comes to introductory war games that is a tried and true system and is just in many variations is uh, the command and color system mm -hmm. it is a great system and it introduces I mean, it's very, very much an introductory game for even mm -hmm. new war gamers mm -hmm. can jump into it fairly quickly. At first, they may seem mm -hmm. a little overwhelmed, especially when you have left, right, center, and you've got cards to play for each of them. And then they start realizing, oh, okay, I get this. And it's not hard at all for them to understand, but they do want, get to understand the frustration of command uh, because they're like, but I need my guys in the center to move and I don't have a center card. Yep. That's the friction of warfare. Yeah, that's you know? your, your, you have sent written orders to your commander in the center yep. and he hasn't acted upon them yet. <laughs> Why? Why has he not done that yet? Yeah. Why you know, has McClellan not moved? <laughs> Damn it, get off your ass. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but this is a thing that happens on yeah. the actual battlefield, right? Where orders mm -hmm. get confused or garbled or don't yeah. get delivered or may maybe it, Probably in rare situations, the, the local commander on the scene is ignoring them. Yes. Um, but these things, these this kind of command and control friction is something that happens. Mm -hmm. And I personally almost require some kind of feature like that in a war game that I'm going to spend any amount of serious time with. 
Um, that is something I absolutely need to see. Yeah, no, it's true. And it's a game that you can grok pretty fast and then you're just con concentrating on the gameplay. Another one that I would say would fall in that, in that line, another series of games would be from Academy. And that is the birth of America series. And then the birth of Europe series with like 1812 and uh, eight, what is it? 1754 and then 1775 where it's, they're very light war games. Mm -hmm. It's area control. You're placing mm -hmm. cubes and then you're playing cards, kind of like, you know, commanding colors. Mm -hmm. And then you're resolving combat with custom dice. So it's a game that you can grok very quickly and play it and get, you know, just dive right into the combat of the game mm -hmm. without having to worry about counters and stacking and different types of units and unit mixtures and things like that, how to benefit your, your force by having the proper force mixture. None of that. It's just cubes. So it makes it simple. Mm -hmm. Mo, you're talking about the birth of America series. You know how I know you're talking about the birth of America series? Because I said you started it. talking about it. You said, <laughs> and then there's the birth of America series from Academy. <laughs> um, thank you, Brant, for your helpful comment and instruction. Uh, but as Brant oh. points out, though, the, the, the players in the professional stuff are, are not you're you're not handing them even a 12 page. Well, you might give them 12 pages, but uh, you're not handing them an 80 page rule book to read. Right? No, that's not the expectation. They're going to be they're going to get help. That's true. That's true. Now, what is the average for the practitioners out there? What would be your average rule book that you would play? Would or, you expect or force other people to play or force, you know, or facilitate because uh, that would be a good, a good one to, to see what you guys have as far as on average, is it a four page, three page, four page, five page, 10 page, you know, how, how deep is, is the, are the rule sets there as opposed to your standard hobby war game? That'd well, the rule set might be process. quite deep because there's people facilitating, right? And, sure, and there's teams that. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even computer assistance in some cases. Yes. Yeah. Um, which, in know, which case you can have an arbitrarily complex model um, without mm -hmm. really having to worry about the, the, the quote unquote players needing to necessarily worry about that at all. And maybe That's even true. the uh, facilitators don't either. They just, they, they're just returning, you know, handing the slips of paper out that the computer printed out. That's true. That's true. So any other questions for us while we're uh, waiting to see if anybody will add in anything about their page count on their, on their rules from the practitioner side. And then these guys are talking about air war. Yeah. So air war was a, a, <laughs> a SPI game that was supposed to be very complicated and very semi semi. I have glanced at it years ago. It did look very complicated. It's, considered very complicated today but i'll point something else out that i've discussed in the past there are expectation of complexity in the hobby war game space has changed since 1980 okay what we considered a really monstrously complicated game back in you know say the 70s or 80s the, the best example of this is third reich the classic third reich mm -hmm. from avalon hill right which Avalon Hill had this one to 10 point complexity score. And I want to say third Reich was a 10, right? Maybe it was a nine, but it was, mm -hmm. it was like their for a while, their most complicated game. Uh, it was considered extremely high complexity. And there's like a disclaimer on the box. This is for experienced war gamers only. Um, nowadays we look at that rule book and I'm like, really? This is <laughs> like, yeah, this is my, uh, you know, this is not any more complicated than triumph and tragedy. Yeah. Um, this is, this is not that bad. So I, so I do feel like our expectations on that uh, as a hobby community have changed over the last 40 years, as you shouldn't be surprised to learn, right? Um, to some extent, that has meant that we're, we're more comfortable with more complicated games, but that hasn't resulted in a shortage of simple games either. There's still plenty mm -hmm. of simple games available. Small, simple, and inexpensive games if those end up being your criteria for, for bringing new people in. Sure. Sure. If that's what you want. And on top of that too, I like simple games as well as I like more complex games for the fact that, Hey, I get this simple game here. It's only six or eight pages of rules, maybe 10. And then you take out all the, the explanation, the scenarios. Okay. It's really about five or six pages. I can read that through real quick, 
throw mm-hmm. it on the table, especially if it's low counter, uh, low counter density, and I can jam out a game in 45 minutes, an hour and a half, depending on, you know, how, how long it takes to play. And then that's a kind of game where it's like, you know, it's nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night. I want to play something before I go to bed. You know, I can pull that game out. I know I can knock out in a game in an hour. I just don't feel like setting up something or pulling out a game where I'm going to be setting it up for the next two hours and I can't play it till tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I can set it up in five minutes and start chucking dice. Those games are great for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, like you said, things have changed. We have different expectations. We have different um, different mindsets now, too. And there's more standardization and rules writing than there was back then uh, and back in those days. Uh in uh, now style is different of course mm-hmm. uh, for each one and uh verbosity as well you know it's like how clean and clear are the rules mm-hmm. for this game as opposed to a game you know similar games from something from 30 years ago to today mm-hmm. back then the, the a lot of the rules tended to be very wordy today they're they tend to be more concise not always but they tend to be more concise which is usually good except for Newer war gamers, except for when Steam, it's not, except for when it's not, or newer war gamers are right. a little confused by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. well, the, so that's actually an interesting point to raise because there are obviously different approaches to how you write the rules. Right? Mm-hmm. There are some rules that are very conversational. There are some rules that are very legalistic. Uh, mm-hmm. There are a lot of games that have uh, rules that fall in somewhere in between the two. Um, yeah. there, there's the, the standard case system that's become traditional for hobby war games, uh, that was ubiquitous for throughout hobby gaming, not just even war gaming. There were, yeah. there, I've got, I probably pulled 30 RPGs off the shelf right now from the early eighties or seventies that used the case system as well. I can pull a couple, uh, RPGs off the shelf from the, from the nineties and two thousands that use the case system. Uh, that you get laughed off a drive-through RPG if you put something like that out now, um, but war gamers are still using it. But we are also seeing, I think, a willingness to break free from the from that format, uh, where the the writer or developer or designer who may all be the same person um, mm. makes the decision to just you know I think this is a better approach to writing this rulebook for this game, right? And sure, and that's where we see something like Atlantic Chase. Which is just a revolution in in now. It remains to be seen whether it's a revolution bigger than a revolution of one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it it could be potentially a revolution in how we present hobby war games. Now, did he write that in the same way he wrote like uh, Storm of the Reich, or not? I haven't Sky's seen Storm of Skies Reich. above the skies above the Reich. I'm sorry, I haven't played that either. So, well, that uh, one, I'm told it's, it's the rules are written a, basically. They walk you through every step of the game. Yes. So it's the same way for for that game, uh, for I, the I, for Atlantic Chase, yes, Atlantic Chase, yeah. So yeah. it is the same way. Okay, so yeah, yeah that is that's not. I, I don't see that as a rule book. I see it as a flip book at that point. Yeah, so it's walking through all the steps. So it's not necessarily teaching you the rules. It's just okay. Next, you move and you can move up to X amount of spaces, mm-hmm. and then you do it. And then well, after that's that, true. then you do this. You know, it, it's like a flip book, which is is just walking you through the steps. You don't have to mm-hmm. learn anything. So in that regard, it's I guess you could say revolutionary in that you could just throw the game down and start playing. You don't have to learn anything. You learn as you play, and then you're pretty much just playing the game, concentrating on playing the game. Mm-hmm. I'm just um, catching up on Jeff's questions. Here. So if, I mean, I think that's a, that's a fair statement to say that is if it's not a rule book, maybe it's not, maybe it's a learning aid. Um, yeah. and that by itself may be de- determined to be desirable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes it, makes the entry point a lot lower mm-hmm. because eventually, you're, yeah. Yeah. You're not having to learn the game. It just, it literally says, okay, step one, op- you know, open the box, step two, lay out the map. Yeah, literally there's a, you open the box and there's a <laughs> sheet on top that says step one, read yeah. this first. Don't yeah. do anything else. Read this first. Yeah. That's actually a phenomenon that we've seen since the, s- maybe even the late seventies, actually that, that, that has mm-hmm. popped up in a couple of places. I uh, usually war games haven't been collated quite that, quite that tight. Yeah. But no. um, where you can count on that particular slip ending up on the top of the box. Yeah. Uh, but I have seen it in RPGs. Cassium uh, mm-hmm. to this day does that kind of thing, actually. But they started doing that in like 1981 or something like that. Yeah. Um, what game? What games have a rule book to be emulated? Obviously, Advanced Squad Leader. 
uh, should definitely be should, emulated. All games all, should be 400 pages. All rules, <laughs> all rule books should be at least 400 pages. That's my uh, opinion on that. Obviously, I, no. I'm um, going to put a suggestion out there for a game nobody's ever heard me talk about, and that would be NATO. <laughs> well, so in, in a sense. And that's uh, good so, and bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as, as, as we've talked before, but the audience is not necessarily privy to. That's a mm -hmm. real. This is NATO. The Cold War goes hot by Bruce Maxwell, released by Compass Games a few years ago in 2021, I believe. And a a new version, a substantially new version of a game that came out in around 1983, uh, or it might even have been 82, actually, but mm -hmm. a very early uh, Victory Games game. Um, it has uh, an 80, 80 some page rule book that is a marvel of clarity. It's yeah. super verbose, um, and it's got a lot of redundancy. Redundancy. But you are going to find the answer that you are looking for in that rule book. And the explanation of what you are looking for is going to be clear. Yes. So. And there's, well, a couple other things. Number one is that can be seen as a negative by some people because they're like, wow, it's 87 pages. That's 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 a monster. It's like, yeah, but when you read the rules, you, number one, you're going to find out that they're not difficult to understand. Most of the stuff that you're going to need is really already on the player aids. So you're good to go there. Uh, when it comes to reading the rules, you're not going to find many, if any, edge cases. Everything mm -hmm. is going to be pretty much explained to you right then and there in, in plain English. Um, the other benefit is he did this veteran summary portion where mm -hmm. it's like, okay, if you've played war games before, you know what a Zoc is. We're going to talk about Zocs here. So skip these next four pages mm -hmm. and you skip them and you move on to the next section or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if you understand supply, basic supply rules, you just need to jump to page 90, not 90, but 51, because that's where we're going to talk about the portion of the supply rules that are specific to this game that you probably don't understand yet because they're specific to this game. So there is a lot of pages you can cut out. Plus a lot of the pages in that rule book are also support. They're explaining the components. They're explaining the, um, the illustrated examples apply stuff like that. So it does cut it down quite a bit, but it, like I said, it's a kind of a double edged sword. It's, it's great because it's very verbose, but it's also bad because it's so verbose that people will go, Oh, it's 87 pages. I'm scared or I'm intimidated by it. It's too much. It's not, not at all. It's, I would call it a, a high medium complexity game. It's, it's, yeah. de it's detailed, but it's not, it's not crazily complex. No, no, it no, is, no. uh, 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 it is often, a useful i'm gonna re, i'm gonna start that over it is sometimes a useful measure of how many pages are in a rule book in determining how uh complicated that game is but there is not a one-to-one -one correlation between page count and complexity yeah uh, there is complexity that can be buried in very simple rules there is uh simple games that are obfuscated by a bad rule book and there are quite complicated games. I mean, I think we could agree that uh, Empires in Arms is a complicated game, and it's got like a twenty-four page, might be forty actually. But I mean, we could we can list numerous examples of games with a twenty-four page rule book that sure. when you start playing them, you realize, hey, this is kind of fiddly and complicated. Yeah. And conversely, we can name examples of uh, eighty or ninety even page rule books that mm -hmm. learn fairly easily from, and yeah. and that's in some means a measure of the quality of the writing, right? Because it is sure technical writing and not everybody is a good technical writer. No. Um no. but um there, there's not necessarily a one to one correlation between those two things. No. And it's all. it's it's important to point out that that those two things are not always connected and that the the number of pages does not necessarily accurately telegraph overall complexity of the game. No, no, not at all. It's, it's very true. Uh, but it is an assumption that you make when you look at a rule book and you're like, Oh my God, it's just thick. It's going to be yeah. really tough. It's no, not you're always. right though. Right. People you know? see that. Oh my God, yeah. there's 75 pages. This, this is very scary. I yeah. don't know if I'm feeling very uncomfortable. I'm sweating now. Oh my God. So, <laughs> but then I you look at, <laughs> you look at any of the fantasy flight. Games. I can't read the, the <laughs> cheesecake factory menu. I can't get through these 75 pages of rules. Oh my God. And then you look at it like the fantasy flight games, they got the two rule books, one that gets you mm -hmm. in the plan and the one that's actually the full rule mm -hmm. book. Um, but you read those and that's written in a conversational tone 
or conversational manner, I should say, mm -hmm. um, versus the case number system that war games, traditional war games are mm -hmm. done with. And this is where I think the case system is far superior in the fact that if I need to find, um, look up something about Zox, okay, I got it. Do you have an index? Okay, you do. Okay, now it's on page 22. I get Don't page even 22. get me started about the lack of indices. In well, game. yeah. You know, but I got to start reading through the whole page to get to the Zoc thing unless there's a Zoc section. Mm -hmm. Whereas on a war game, it'll say Zox 7.1 or 7.0. You go, mm -hmm. 7.0. Here's everything for Zox. I don't have to worry about anything else on it. So, um, so I think that case system has, it's more organized and orderly and easier to reference. I have always found the case system to be intuitive personally. Yeah, now, very intuitive. Now, part of this is because I've been doing this since I was 10, right? Um, but there also, we should also recognize that there are different ways to implement that case system. The kind sure. of classic idea is the SPI approach, which was also borrowed by a lot of Avalon Hill games, but not all of them, where you have cases and subcases and subcases and sub, sub, sub cases and all this. And so you've you know, got this kind of outline style hierarchy that mm -hmm. shows you where the rule is right there are, there's also the gdw approach to the case system which is much looser and which is also used by some modern games including some things from mmp where yeah there's a case system but you have like case four supply and case four is three pages, right? Yeah. And there's no sub cases under case four supply. Yeah. So, that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it can at least be in that specific example that I'm thinking of, which is Europa. Uh, it can be less helpful. Yes. Um, and that's true of GTS too, to be honest about it. I felt like, mm -hmm. uh, I felt like, and we talked about this when we were playing. This is the grand tactical series from multi-man publishing a series of very large company scale games um we we That's talked the about grand that. that yes <laughs> the and it's it's both grand and technical um the uh it's like i i like both both kinds of music country and western um <laughs> the uh we talked about that because we you know these are all crusty old war gamers we're talking you know this may way easier robot to parse if we had if it was just in the case system instead sure. of like chapter two supply you know whatever yeah. it was no it's very true uh so i mean we're we're kind of getting towards the end so before we end up wrapping everything up we got a few more minutes but i wanted to see if there were any last questions that people had out there or comments anything you wanted to chime in with um jeff said the case system has a nice linear logic to it and then uh, dragoon commander was bringing up about uh, ben madison games mm -hmm. this was brant mm -hmm. ben madison's games which are very clear and very understandable, very distracting by the background that that's put that the the rule books come in. I, I found I, I love his stuff, but um, I find that they're the background of the that's another big important thing when it comes to doing a rule book. I'm not a big fan of backgrounds on rule books. You I mean want, like the textured page? Yeah. Not I'm a also fan not a fan of that. I just want I, the, I don't know that I have a Ben Madison example of it, but I'm uh, also not a fan of that. Like the White Tribe. Uh, I don't have I, that. I, I found I've that got one the was... mission, though, which is one of his, and it's terrific. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the, the rules are easy to understand, mm -hmm. but I just found that with the background stuff and the different colors, I just kind of found it a little mm -hmm. distracting. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I don't like that. Now, if you have background text, like there's another one is about uh, Liberia that I have, mm -hmm. and that one is on textured... Is it on actual antelope hide? No, it's not. It is. That would be all, that's the deluxe edition. <laughs> you didn't get that one. No, I didn't get that one. I only got the, I have the only uh, version of that game available, which is Counter-Strike, Liberia mm. Descent into Hell. And mm. that is, uh, it's a very unique topic, very unique game, and it will probably never be made again, mm. uh, which is another reason why I will not give it up. Um, Who's the publisher? It, it was, um, oh. Why am I just going drawing a blank? Um, the uh, not fiery dragon was it? The small the remember the small games that they did in the small cardboard boxes, and I oh, I got to look it up. That one I'm going to have to look up now. Uh, uh, Meta gaming? <laughs> They've been no. gone since like 1985. No, um, it, it was. I'm going to tell you right now. Not tiny battle publishing or. Um, 
victory point games. Platinum Dragon Productions? What that? No, that's not it. It was. That sounds like a that sounds like a D and D thing to me. Yeah, I, that's not. Platinum Dragon Productions is not right. That is fire. It was Fiery Dragon. Huh. It was Fiery Dragon. They did um, a bunch of different games, and that was one of them. And it was in a small, uh, small little cardboard box, real mm. thin, real small. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, it's a game that you can't find anymore. I don't think anybody will have an interest in printing it because it's a unique game. It's different. And Liberia was a very different war. So, um, you know, you don't normally have topics like cannibalism, voodoo, and things like that in a modern conflict game. But you did in Liberia. So okay. those were real aspects that he incorporated into the game. Huh, so okay. that's not something that's going to be real palatable to a lot of people. Well, I imagine so, not. Yeah. I'd have yeah. to, I'd be curious to see how that's implemented. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's not one that I've looked at and I've got several of his more recent, uh, items from white dog games, um, mm -hmm. including some, some, some stuff that I like a lot, actually. Yeah, they do. They, theirs is better. Uh, now it was white dog that did, um, the white tribe. And I, that was, I think it was just the rules at the time. Maybe it was just the night I was reading the rules that I was like, man, I just find it distracting with the different colors on the rules. I have to pull them out now and see if I can remember what mm -hmm. it was. But Jeff is saying that Mrs. Thatcher's war, uh, described by the rough swordsman is very easy to follow, mm -hmm. which it is. Um, that's another interesting one. Uh, that's, uh, uh, who published that? White Dog. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Thatcher's Mrs. War. Mrs. Thatcher's War. Okay, I can picture the box in my head. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I was thinking it wasn't White Dog <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, no, it was. Uh... Uh, but I, I suspect I'm thinking of of any of a number of other Falklands games that are either out and it were released in the last couple of years or are about to be released because there have been a couple. Yeah, and that was White Dog Games that mm -hmm. did do that. I just want to double check myself on that. Uh, White Dog did it. Uh, you you may be thinking of um, the one that is completely totally out of print, and that where there was Discord. Where there is Discord. Okay, that this one. A, you might be thinking of that because that one was out of print. That's one that I that I'm thinking of. Yeah. Plus, Goose Green is coming. Goose a Green yeah. came from MMP on the phone. Yeah. on Goose Green, right? Uh, so, which uh, we'll probably play actually. Lock and load Lock is and coming load out with, uh, of the Falklands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. isn't that out already? That. No, they got that when I thought. Wait, no, I'm thinking of Grenada. They have Falklands out already. Okay. It's Grenada that they're coming out with. Yeah, okay. They have the Falklands out though. Okay, yeah. is Clint Eastwood in that game? He's not. They should have Gunny Highway in that. Though. They should for I'm sure. Just saying they definitely should. need to have Gunny Highway in there, mm -hmm. and then that crappy supply captain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> who's a walking cluster as an infantry officer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, okay, last call for any questions here uh, or any comments. We really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in and, Absolutely. and joining us tonight. And uh, all questions have been answered. Wow. All questions have been answered. We are efficient. Apparently so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, our, that's all the preparation we did for this show is what it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See to the very works. Quickly due to all of the preparation that we did. Yeah. <laughs> We're professional like that. But anyway, if you guys want to check out our stuff, uh, go check out Art Wolf Slayer. That is yep, that's Larry's me. channel. That's me. <laughs> and he's got, uh, a, he's pretty much online all the time. He's on Monday, Tuesday nights with a live mm -hmm. show. That's and true. then you've got something coming up tomorrow night, correct? I do. It's a, it's an interview with the designer, Justin Thompson, of uh, the game Julius Caesar, which is a block mm. game from Columbia Games, which is currently, uh, uh, there is a new edition of it on Kickstarter right now. Oh, nice. That well, should be interesting. Yeah, Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. That is not a usual slot, but that's, that's what I could set up. So That's a live one, right? That's not a recorded. Yeah. No, that's live. Yep. So make sure that you guys tune into that because he'll be doing a live show and it's just same format that we're doing here where it's just mm -hmm. pretty much very interactive uh, where you can ask questions. Now he'll be interviewing somebody. So obviously you have a question, yeah. you throw it up there and when he notices it, he'll add that in as mm -hmm. one of the questions. That's true. Yeah. And then you, there you go right there. Art Wolf Slayer. Thank and you. then I have Mo's Game Mr. Table Commander. with my channel. Yes. Um, most game tables, my channel, and we have show whiskey Charlie on there that we do once a month. 
Uh, we'll have another show probably next. I think we're planning on one for Tuesday. So unless there's any change of plans, we should be doing one on Tuesday. And then of course we all both post videos all the time. Uh, oh, yeah. well, not all the time, but when we get a chance, <laughs> we post videos on a regular basis yeah. put it that way. And our copious free time. Yes. yes. Special thanks also to the Rangoon commander for uh, getting this set up. <laughs> yes, definitely uh, appreciate uh, Merle and, and Brant uh, and everybody from, from uh, Connections for helping us out on this and uh, inviting us to join in with you guys. And we, totally uh, we've we had a great time. Made. Totally What's getting that? t-shirts. I'm totally getting armchair Rangoon's t-shirts. <laughs> uh, 